naval maneuvers of the 70s. Hundreds of vessels, thousands of naval aircraft. Location, seas and ocean. Reconnaissance amphibians, anti-submarine airplanes and helicopters equipped with means of submarine search and destruction. Land-based missile carriers capable of destroying an aircraft carrier of a potential enemy. Ship-based aircraft are expected to be put on service. The Soviet naval aviation of the 70s represented a strong force. Russia, Sebastopol. September of 1910 was warm. On September 16, a huge crowd gathered at a suburban field to watch the first naval airplane. Everyone already got used to locos and automobile. Now there was a new technical wonder. The airplane made a run along the field and started to take off. The crowd screamed in fascination. The pilot waved his hand from the cabin. The airplane was piloted by a naval lieutenant Stanislav Dorozhinsky. Such was the first flight of the Russian naval aviation. A week later, another pilot, Georgi Piotrovsky, together with his mechanic, flew from Petersburg to Kronstadt. Twenty miles were covered within half an hour. Reporters called Piotrovsky a long-range pilot. It was a real achievement for that time. Airplanes were not famous for their reliability, and any emergency water landing did not look promising. Airplanes with floats and flying boats were thought to be more suitable for the naval aviation of that time. For many years, hydroplanes became the lords at sea mastering all military professions. The hydro aviation primacy failed only by the 30s. Mastering of high speed was then the main topic. So the float machines, with their bulky landing gears, stepped off the scene. They could not compete in speed with the land-based aircraft, and when the shore-based airplanes gained sufficient reliability, they started to oust the flying boats as well. Those were the worldwide tendencies. Besides, the leading naval nations made their stakes on the aircraft capable of taking off from a deck. Ship-based aviation was highly mobile and could appear in any part of the world ocean. That's why the countries possessing colonies scattered all over the world were most interested in the aircraft carriers. The United States did not have any colony. But being geographically remote from the world events, they strived to take part in them. So they made a stake on aircraft carriers either. Japan followed the same path. Things went different in the USSR. The Navy was in disfavor and did not look strong. The naval aviation, which was regarded as a supplement to the ship's artillery, received almost no attention. All kinds of resolutions defining Navy development could change nothing. Since the USSR did not have any aircraft carriers, almost all naval aviation was ground-based. Its formation was based on that of the land-based air force, so the airplanes were of the same types. In quantity, naval aviation was much smaller than the land-based air force. The situation started to improve only after 1937, when aircraft production in the USSR began to grow. Naval aviation received around 2,500 machines, torpedo carriers, fighters, reconnaissance planes. Europe was approaching the war, and most of the aircraft were located in the west of the country at the Black, Baltic and Barents Seas. That's how the Soviet naval aviation entered the war. 
fighters were the first to enter combat action. Boris Safonov opened his victorious account in the north. Three months after the war started, he was awarded the hero of the Soviet Union title. He shot down 30 enemy aircraft. Safonov was awarded the second hero star posthumously. In spring 1942, he did not return from a mission. Naval pilots were the first to bomb Berlin. In August 1941, bombers of the Baltic fleet took part in the raids over the German capital. The range from the rear airdromes was too big, while it was quite all right to fly from an island in the Baltic Sea. The air group was headed by Evgeny Preobrazhensky. Naval pilots bombed German cities at night throughout a month. However, those were exclusions. Situation in the first half of the war was not very active. There was no sufficient naval confrontation at the Black Sea. In the Baltic, the Soviet ships were blocked in the Gulf of Finland, so that the Germans called this area their internal sea. Their ships moved there freely and with no cover. The Soviet naval aviation was more or less active in the Arctic Ocean. However, in general, there was not much work at sea and the naval aviation was used to perform tasks set before the Air Force, attacking ground-based targets. The main sea battles at that time took place far away from the Soviet Union, in the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. In the end of 1941, the United States and Japan entered the war. On December 7, Japanese aircraft destroyed Pearl Harbor, the American naval base. From that moment, not a single operation in that theater of war was performed without aviation. The more the war developed, the more leading role it played. Enormous battles in the Pacific Ocean took place between the Japanese and American aircraft carrying units with the participation of a huge number of aircraft. Hundreds of ships were destroyed. Their total tonnage would have made any country a leading naval empire. Gradually Americans started to win and Japan applied suicide pilots as the last attempt to halt the defeat. The Soviet naval aviation activities were at a lower level. But the naval pilots did make their contribution to the final victory. The flying boats performed reconnaissance tasks. Fighters were covering the attack aircraft. Most of the combat flights were made by the attack aviation. It entered the naval aviation right before the war and its main power was the Il-2 attack aircraft. Il-4 worked against the enemy ships and transport vessels. This Aleutians aircraft was the main Soviet long-range bomber. In the naval aviation, it was used as a torpedo carrier. Torpedoes were suspended under the aircraft's fuselage. Torpedoes meant for high-altitude attacks were equipped with a stabilizing parachute, which was put in a special container. The Il-4 combat radius allowed to detect and attack targets at a large distance from the shore. Flower bed. This is Poppy 1. The orchestra is playing its tune. Let's start working. Do you read me? Over. Poppy 1, this is Flower bed. Read you. Take your places. More to your right. That's it. War footage.
In the second half of the war, the Soviet naval aviation received deliveries from the Allies. Kitty Hawk fighter, Air Cobra fighter, Catalina flying boats. But the best acquisition for the naval aviation was the American Boston bomber. Refurbished into a torpedo carrier, it was best suitable for such tasks. Although, it was perfect in its main application as a bomber. One of the most efficient practice was the master head bombing. The aircraft would approach the target at the top of the ship masts. The bomb dropped from such a height would rebound and submerge right near the target. A hit under the waterline for a ship would be blistering. After the war, time came to draw conclusions. The Soviet naval aviation obtained a minor experience of its own. But there was experience of the Allies, and it showed that most of the ships were sent to the bottom by aircraft. This gave the ground to regard aviation, if not the main, then at least one of the main striking forces at sea. The Soviet post-war plans assumed development of a huge ocean-wide navy, including aircraft carriers. But in result, this was deemed to be excessive for the national defense. Preference was given to long-range bombers with nuclear weapons. Therefore, the Navy development plans were significantly cut down. Aircraft carriers were not built at all. As to the naval aviation, not many changes were anticipated. Besides, studying the former Allies' naval aviation experience was a risk of falling under accusation of worshipping the West. The post-war cutdown of the naval aviation allowed to get rid of the outdated aircraft. However, new aircraft supplies followed the old principle. Thus, in 1947, several Tu-2 bomber units were transferred from the Air Force to the Navy. The latter refurbished them into torpedo carriers in spite of the fact that the Tupolev's machine was not suitable for such a role. It did not have the required onboard equipment but there was not much to choose from. After the piston engine machines, the naval aviation started to receive jet aircraft. The first were MiG-15 fighters. Their rearmament was significant and was made within a very short time. Units began to get used to the jet engine sound, a sign of a new stage of the aviation development. Everything was unusual in the new machines. The cockpit design, the reliable radio communication, the absence of noise, all was surprising. But there were concerns. Engines were not at all reliable, so pilots had to use emergency escape all the time trying to make it more habitual without the catapult. Time was needed for the jet aircraft to break old images and become knocked home. There were MiG-15, then MiG-17, then the supersonic MiG-19. New aircraft appeared fast in those years. However, new machines were joining the Air Force in the first place, and only after that the naval aviation. After the jet fighters, the naval aviation obtained the jet bombers. Those were Il-28 and Tu-14. There started a kind of a competition between the two machines. The first Tu-14 flight was performed by Fyodor Apache in December 1947. The speed for a bomber of that time was fantastic, 900 kilometers per hour. The prototype machine was equipped with three engines purchased in England. 
However, they were consuming too much fuel and the assigned range could hardly be reached. Later, the Soviet, more powerful engines were developed on the basis of the British ones and TU-14 was put into production as a two-engine variant. The free part of the tail was now used to accommodate a gunner. The new engines increased the range, but the speed dropped. In speed and the number of other characteristics, TU-14 was inferior to Il-28. Frankly, the Tupolev's aircraft was not much of a success. While Il-28 turned out to be a surprisingly simple and reliable bomber. It joined their force in huge quantities. Using its authority, Tupolev tried to push his aircraft through. The Air Force refused it while the Navy command failed to counter the Tupolev's Tu-14. To be fair, Tu-14 had one advantage. Torpedoes fitted the bomb bay and did not diminish flight characteristics. However, the time of torpedo aviation was coming to an end. As a result, the naval aviation accepted 80 Tu-14 aircraft while the amount of Il-28 was 800, 10 times more. Changes took place in the reconnaissance aviation units. Instead of the outdated Tu-2, there were now the Il-28 based reconnaissance planes. Additional fuel tanks at the wing ends provided for the 5 hour flight duration. The flying boats also performed reconnaissance tasks. Their fleet was also renewed. The outdated machines were ousted by the modern BE-6. In the 50s, the naval aviation obtained the first helicopters. Some of them designed specially for the Navy. There was also a quite unusual machine in the history of the Soviet naval aviation. It was Tu-91. The Tupolev's design bureau started to make it for the first Soviet aircraft carrier, which was also still supposed to be built. But development of a ship of such class turned out unrealistic and in 1953 requirements for Tu-91 were reconsidered. It was supposed to become a diving bomber torpedo carrier. It was going to use sand airdromes of limited dimensions for takeoff and landing. Such capacities were provided by a powerful turboprop engine driving coaxial propeller. For its unusual look, the aircraft was called a bull cull. The offensive and defensive arsenal of a torpedo carrier and its outstanding flight characteristics seem to provide it a great future. But its designation was no more actual. The days of the mine and torpedo aviation were gone. With a higher flight speed, a torpedo drop and its water entry became doubtful. Besides, in the 50s, the potential enemy already had powerful defensive means. They did not allow the aircraft to approach the target for a torpedo attack. The way out was seen in the development of a principally new means of destruction. Thus, a new type of weapons was entering the stage. The cruise missiles. They brought a new quality to the naval aviation. The Soviet experts were working on cruise missiles and guided bombs for quite a while. They were using the German developments as trophies. The first cruise missile passed into service was Comet and its carrier was Tu-4 bomber, arrived to the naval aviation from the Air Force. Although there was no alternative, at that time, only the huge Tu-4 could pick up a cruise missile. Tu-4 gave the first experience while the main work started in the 50s when the Tu-16 jet aircraft passed into service. It produced a good impression. Elegant, silvery skyward. 
its first variant was equipped with two comets. Soon there appeared a combat TU-16K-10 system with a powerful radar and a new supersonic missile. Operator was guiding the weapon from a cabin full of advanced equipment. Such system allowed not to approach the ship but attack it from a distance of up to 200 kilometers. By that time the main sea threat for the Soviet Union was coming from the NATO aircraft carriers. They were assumed to be approaching the shore to a distance enough for the ship-based attack aircraft to be able to produce a tactical nuclear hit. So it was essential not to allow the aircraft carriers to approach the shore within the ship-based aviation range. This particular task was set before the TU-16 aircraft. Later, they were joined by the TU-22 based strike complexes. Soon the aircraft carriers turned to be just half of the problem. The American nuclear submarines with ballistic missiles on board represented no less threat. They were on combat duty since the 60s. They could use their weapons at different remoteness from the shore. So it became extremely difficult to keep full control over the areas of their patrolling. The sea warfare strategy had to be radically reconsidered. The use of maneuverable forces seemed to be the only possible submarine search tactics. Besides, a system of interception lines was developed. This provided for the use of different aircraft at various remoteness from the shore. The BE-12 amphibians were barraging close to the coast. The main hopes were with the long-range anti-submarine aircraft complex Il-38. It was based on the highly reliable Il-18 airliner. Improvement of the complicated search equipment took several years. The aircraft was passed into service in 1969. The search algorithm was soon established. Il-38 carried locator beacons which were dropped in the area of the submarine possible location creating a kind of a barrier. Information on the submarine was transmitted to the aircraft. Then, acoustic operators had to find the submarine sound in the depth of the ocean. Commander, activity on Beacon 8. Classify target. Target lock on. The roar of the turboprop engines was very disturbing. Thorough listening required silence. Almost simultaneously, Americans issued a similar Orion aircraft. Its main distinction was in a more advanced radio electronic equipment. Basically, both machines were alike. This allowed cinema people to use Il-38 for the role of Orion in one of the Soviet films of that time. Airborne target left side, Orion. Russian reconnaissance plane on right. Look at the way the Russians are fueling. You got four tons. How is the fight? Very good behavior. Helicopters were also used to fight submarines. Some worked from the deck, others from the shore. Both airplanes and helicopters acting at their own lines could find the submarine and attack it. For this purpose aircraft were equipped with search and striking systems. Such systems were continuously modernized.
As before, missile carriers were used to fight submarines. Missile carriers in flight refueling was mastered. It was not an easy operation, but allowed to significantly increase the range. New generations of cruise missiles were coming on stage. They were becoming more improved with better characteristics in range, reliability and precision. The extent of counteraction was high. The enemy's aircraft carrier units had to be kept under constant surveillance. The contact was extremely close. On May 25, 1968, a Tu-16 reconnaissance plane flew over a U.S. aircraft carrier so low that it touched the water and crushed. Potential enemy continued its improvement. By mid-60s, Americans passed new ballistic missile submarine into service with a range of several thousand kilometers. Almost every point of the world ocean now had to be put under watch. A super complicated task, but it had to be resolved. Submarines had to be found at any remoteness. The aircraft carriers were also had to be detected the earlier the better. The work of reconnaissance planes was difficult since they were under constant attention of the NATO pilots. The problems were global and the funding was generous. In 1965 the necessity to observe enormous areas led to appearance of the Tu-95 aircraft in the naval aviation. They carried only surface search equipment. Detecting the target, they passed its coordinates to the striking aircraft and ships. They could do it at a quite a distance from the Soviet shores. With one refueling, Tu-95 had a range of 14,000 kilometers, one-third of equator. The observation lines were as far as the Bermuda. The aircraft carriers were now detected three to four days prior to their approach of the ship-based attack aircraft range. However, Tu-95 Erze could neither find nor destroy the submarines. The naval aviation did not yet have any other aircraft to perform such tasks. Maneuvers of the Soviet Navy in the 70s went one after another. They were staged with a lot of sound and fume effects. Maneuvers directly reflected the funding. There was a serious competition among different institutions. Not only the naval aviation pretended to fight submarines. The strategic missile forces suggested not to search for submarines like for a pin's head, but to put, for instance, a whole Norwegian sea under a nuclear carbon. The long-range aviation also wanted to perform strikes at sea targets, leaving the naval aviation with the modest task of an air designator. The Navy command insisted that the naval aviation would perform such task by itself if it is attached with the long-range aircraft. Disputes were partially stopped by the appearance of Tu-142, an anti-submarine version of the Tu-95 bomber, specially made for the Navy. Tu-142 was carrying not only search equipment but means of the submarine destruction. The naval aviation obtained complete independence in the sea task performance. The new status allowed to demand new types of weapons. A new Tu-22M missile carrier was developed by the Tupolev Design Bureau. It even joined the naval aviation earlier than the long-range aviation. Soon the Navy command decided to have attack aircraft of their own to assist marine assault forces. 
never before the naval aviation had such a great power. World ocean activities required coordinated behavior in neutral water. In the beginning of the 70s, relevant agreements were signed first in Moscow and then in Washington, D.C. Not to provoke each other, the parties were obliged to fly with the switched-on navigating lights, not to fly over other ships at a supersonic speed, and not to imitate attacks. Agreements were very actual. The U.S. Navy alone contained dozens of aircraft carriers of different classes sailing across the world ocean. Americans obtained ample experience in the Second World War and reached it in Vietnam and by the 70s possessed a powerful and efficient instrument of the big politics. An aircraft is like a city, coherent work of all units, aircraft lifting to the main deck, takeoffs and landings one after another. Reconnaissance planes, fighters, and attack aircraft on board, with the latter carrying tactical nuclear weapons. The Soviet Navy Command saw how efficient the American aircraft carrier's fleet was. And it always wanted to have aircraft carriers of its own. Realization of such plans took a lot of time and finally aircraft carrying ships appeared in the Soviet Navy. At first they carried helicopters which needed only a small pad for takeoff. Soon special aircraft were built. The stake was made on machines capable of vertical takeoff and landing. Like helicopters they did not require huge deck space. Such experiments went on in many countries. Development of such a machine in the USSR was undertaken by Alexander Yakovlev. But the task was very difficult, therefore an experimental prototype was first built. It was Yak-36. This aircraft was equipped with two lift cruise engines. The nozzles at vertical takeoff were first put downward, then turned, putting the aircraft into a horizontal flight. This aircraft had a complicated control and stabilization system with a wing end, nose and tail control kits. Its predecessor was the Turbolot developed by the Flight Research Institute in 1956. It was piloted by Yuri Garnay. He was the one who first tested Yak-36. At first, the aircraft was tested in a tied-up position. Then there were short approaches, tested by Valentin Muchin. Every new success in this sphere puts more problems than it solves, Yakov Levy used to say about this aircraft. On July 27, 1964, Muchin performed the first flight although it was not vertical. Only two years thereafter, Yak-36 made its complete cycle. Vertical takeoff, horizontal flight, and vertical landing. In 1967, the machine was shown at an air parade. Demonstrations of new aircraft could no more surprise the public accustomed to the Soviet aircraft industry novelty. But this time, no one could stay indifferent. The aircraft was taking off vertically and stood fixed in the air. Upon results of the Yak-36 tests, a resolution was issued on the development of a combat vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. 
It was called Yak-36M. The new aircraft layout differed from its predecessor. The main difference was in the power plant. So the aircraft was equipped with three engines, two lift engines and one lift cruise engine. Such power plant complication raised skepticism among aviation experts. For example, the British vertical takeoff Harrier had a single engine with four pivoting nozzles. However, Stanislav Mardovian conducting the project in the Yakovlev Design Bureau suggested that in the USSR there was no such engine as the British one. The first Yak-36 landing on the deck of the Moscow cruiser was performed by test pilot Mikhail Dexbach on November 18, 1972. On November 22, he took off the aircraft from the deck, made a circle flight and vertically landed. An entry in the ship log appeared, birthday of the ship-based aviation. Then there were tests of takeoffs and landings at rolling and on a moving ship. The aircraft armament allowed to work on ground, sea and aerial targets. The aircraft became operational as Yak-38 in August 1976. It was based on heavy aircraft carrying cruisers. In order to increase combat load, a new practice was mastered, a short round takeoff. The long cruiser deck allowed to do that. The vertical takeoff Yak-38's capabilities were inferior to ordinary aircraft of the same class. However, there were no other machines in the Soviet Union that could take off and land on a ship deck. If we compare Yak-38 and the British Harrier, their technical and tactical characteristics were almost the same. But in spite of all the attractiveness of vertical takeoff and landing, those were rather complicated flight regimes. Therefore, Yak-38 was equipped with a forced emergency escape system. Emergency developments were so quick that the pilot had no time to escape without the help of automatic control. Attitude toward ship-based aviation in the Soviet Union started gradually to change. Although there was still a long way to catch up with the NATO countries with their powerful aircraft carrying fleets. In the beginning of the 80s, there were only four Soviet cruisers carrying vertical takeoff aircraft. Therefore, apart from mastering combat vessels, landing on civil dry cargo and container carriers were tested. Right after successful completion of the Yak-38 state tests, the Yakovlev Design Bureau was assigned development of a new vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. It was a supersonic Yak-141. It was supposed to be a single lift cruise engine machine. But in result, the Yak-38-based combined power plant was applied. The first flight was performed in March 1987 by test pilot Andrei Sinitsyn. The new aircraft capabilities were already comparable to the ordinary fighter's capabilities. Wide use of the British Harrier showed that losing to ordinary aircraft in one thing, the verticals were winning somewhere else. For example, they lose in a common fight, while in close combat using helicopter hovering, they win.
but for the Yak-141 all these reasons were no more important. Tests fell on the uneasy 90s, and when another accident occurred at landing on the ship, it was a formal cause to terminate works not only on Yak-141, but on the entire vertical takeoff and landing topic. Moreover, the Russian ship-based aviation by that time was developing in a different direction. Construction of a classical aircraft carrying cruiser with a long and free deck for takeoff and landing. However, instead of a booster catapult used on American aircraft carriers, this cruiser had a sky jump. Together with the ship development, selection of the aircraft was started. To make the task easier, it was assumed to modify the existing types. Prior to starting from a ship, aircraft were supposed to undergo long testing at a specially built ground complex Nitka. It was located in the Crimea, where climate allowed to perform tests all year round. Nitka was absolutely identical to the Skyjump cruiser. It had radar and visual landing support systems and the resting gears. The complex was made for both testing aircraft and training ship-based aviation pilots. In conditions close to reality, it helped to train takeoff and landing on an aircraft carrier deck. In result of comprehensive selection, the MiG-29 and Su-27 naval modifications became the main ship basing contenders. In order to train pilots, the Suhoi Design Bureau offered the Su-25 UTG trainer made on the basis of a cheap and simple land-based attack aircraft. While pilots were trained at Nitka, the ship was ready. Changing several names by 1989, it carried the signed Belisi on board. On October 27, an Su-27K piloted by Viktor Pugachev and the MiG-29K piloted by Tokhtar Aubakirov appeared above the ship. Tests on flyby passes along the deck, passes and touchdowns went on. On November 1, 1989, both aircraft, as usual, were going in circles, imitating landing. Tell Pugachev, let's work. This time I'll land. Got you. Arresting gears ready. Landing weight 20 tons. Arresting gears ready. At 1.46 p.m., Viktor Pugachev brilliantly landed his Su-27K on the deck. It was the first in Russia landing of an ordinary aircraft on the ship. Greeting the pilot, everyone almost forgot the other aircraft. After a short while, MiG-29K of Tokhtar Aubakirov landed on deck as well. There was always a competition between Mikoyan and Suhoi corporations. The first landing of Su-27 gave a lead to the Suhoi Corporation. On the same day, parity was restored. Tokhtar Aubakirov was the first to take off his MiG from the ship's sky jump. On the same day, the Su-25 UTG landed on deck. It was piloted by Alexander Krutov and Igor Botchinsov. 
Aircraft naval versions have specific distinctions from the base versions. A stronger landing gear, an arresting hook, a folding wing for a compact ship basing. Special means were used to protect aircraft from corrosion. The Su-27K fighter was supposed to attack airborne targets, while MiG-29K was aimed at ground and sea surface targets. Further ship-based aircraft developments fell on the times of the USSR collapse. The use of both fighters was no more possible and the choice in favor of only one had to be made. MiG-29K was more compact. 28 MiGs could be placed on a ship instead of only 18 Suhoi's. But Su-27 had a longer range. Its landing speed was lower than of the MiGs, which was important at landing on a short deck. The choice was not simple. Finally, the stake was made on Su-27, which was called Su-33. The aircraft carrier was also renamed. It was called the USSR Fleet Admiral Kuznetsov. But the MiG-29K story did not finish there. In mid-90s, the Navy of India got interested in the aircraft. Upon the customer's request, the Mikayan Design Bureau made a new version, even two versions, a one-seat MiG-29K and a two-seat MiG-29KUB. The avionics and armament was of course updated. Those aircraft took off in 2007. The Suhoi Corporation also continued its research. It made its two-seat ship-based fighter even earlier. It was Su-27KUB. It was demonstrated among other Suhoi ship-based machines at the air show in Zhukovsky. It is very prestigious to show your skills on public, but there is also work day after day. Everywhere in the world, ship-based aviation pilots are considered to be an elite. Landing on an aircraft carrier is not an ordinary thing. It is not easy for a heavy machine to get on a small rolling deck. Pilots are helped by the special ship landing equipment. One is the moon, a system of floodlights. When the pilot approaches a ship, he sees a certain light. Yellow if the aircraft is above the given path. Red if it is below and there is a threat of hitting the stern. Green means correct landing. The arresting hook will grab one of the arresting wires and the landing speed will be killed almost at once. This causes enormous G-loads over the aircraft and the pilots. No less difficult is the takeoff. A 30-ton fighter must gain the required takeoff speed on a 100-meter strip. The ship-based aviation became an integral part of the naval aviation. Navy is a specific instrument of the state. Complex but mobile and efficient. Navy can support peace and stability in any part of the world ocean. It can be independent or part of international forces, or can repel aggression at its coast, or protect economically important parts of its country. It can be a component of nuclear deterrence. Navy carries out different tasks, while naval aviation is one of its important parts. 
this needs no proof.